Hello and welcome once again to this wonderful offering by nailib.com. Today we are dealing with the history SL syllabus and within that we are talking about paper 1 which deals with the move to global war. Just a reminder, this is one amongst the many or rather five prescribed subjects that the IB suggests for us and we've chosen here at Nail IB to continue with the move to global war. In that, we are starting with the very first case study which deals with Japanese expansion between 1931 and 1941 and just like all of history, the key term about any event is how that event was caused and how did it come about which in other words refers to the causes of an event or causes of a certain happening. So in this case, we are looking at the causes of expansion of Japanese militarism and that shall be our focus for the coming few videos. So without any further ado, let's jump straight into the question and the causes of expansion in Japan between 1868 and 1930. Now, so obviously you've understood that while the expansion is between 1931 and 41, the actual causes go as far back as 1868. This is a time when Japan is going through a lot of changes and it, it's these changes between 1868 and 1930 that cause the kind of expansion that we see, the military expansion that we see in Japan between 1931 and 1941. So in order to understand those 10 years, you need to go back at least as far back as 1868. So what does Japan look like and what is the entire idea of Japan as far as these years are concerned? A good starting point is of course the key event which forces us to look at this entire process of expansion. And in this case, the expansion that Japan is doing despite being a member of the League of Nations. The League of Nations is an international body that has been established after the Great War, which later on subsequently was called the First World War. And at the end of that war, several countries, the winning countries especially, they came together and through a treaty called the Treaty of Versailles, amongst many other treaties that were signed at a conference called the Paris Peace Conference, they decide to organize and form a League of Nations. Japan is a member of that League of Nations and yet Japan is an errant member of that League of Nations. It's a member that is always causing different kinds of crises or different kinds of questionings of the authority of the League of Nations which is why this errant country is expanding and the question is why on what basis is these is this country then then attacking or is questioning or is expanding in this way while the end of this entire uh, expansion is the pearl harbor attack in 1941 it is important to remember that to some extent such aggressive policy making, you know, you have, you've attacked Manchuria before that in the 30s and now you're attacking the US in 1941. All of these changes were prompted by changes that Japan in fact underwent as a country underwent after the late 1800s when it opened its doors to Western influence. Japan, like any other Asian country, has always had this option of going either with its own background, so building on their own history, or being open to Western influences. And from 1800s, Japan seems to be opening itself to Western influences, thereby abandoning its own traditional military government and elevating its emperor to a position of authority, almost giving it this kind of a godlike status. All right, so this is something that, that is a change. So basically focusing on that individual of the emperor in his person, and abandoning a military government that usually held traditional power in Japan. These changes were meant to transform Japan into a strong and modern nation. Again, the key term here is modernity. They have to be this like kind of a modern, powerful nation that has this kind of an aspect from the Western perspective. And not only to defend itself against the encroachment of Western imperialism, but also able to compete and establish itself as a first-rate power vis-a-vis not only the great powers in Europe, but also in the United States. Most importantly, it needed to educate its population and instill in them a very strong sense of nationalism. For those of us who've lived through this time of the Brexit and who've lived this through the time of the rise of Donald Trump in the United States, you do know how important nationalism is in, as a spirit 
as a way in which politics is usually organized. So keeping all of that in mind, it's very important to remember that all of these ideas of nationalism and all of these ideas of military superiority, they're all floating around and they're all flowing around in a certain kind of context of modernity through which Japan, an Asian nation, wants to change itself according to Western influences. Between 1868 and 1930, many of these aims were in fact achieved because Japan fought and won the Sino-Japanese War of 1894, the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, it signed a Treaty of Alliance with Britain in 1902, and finally it entered the World War I in August of 1914. So I'm just underlining all these key dates for you so that you remember that these are the key dates which will pepper your answer in case a question deals with the causes of expansion. Do remember it's a source-based paper. So you will never be expected to know all of this as an answer and an essay-like context where you can just pepper it wherever you wish to as per your structure. You will be expected to pepper these details as a reply to a source-based question by adding context. So especially the nine marker where you will be expected to know context, but even in the OPVL or even in the compare and contrast question, you might require such details so that your answer is further strengthened. So knowing that where all Japan fought and won, thereby strengthening the militarism that was going on. You know, when you win a war, it actually strengthens that idea that good, we are a military power, let other countries be afraid of us. So in that kind of an attitude, with that kind of an attitude, Japan is progressing. This period of momentous change can in fact be traced back to the arrival of Commodore Perry and what contemporary of observers had referred to as the four black ships of evil in 1853. An event that led to crisis of seismic proportions as different political and military factions within Japan called either for the country's continued isolation or alternatively for the rapid absorption of all knowledge that could be gleaned from Western powers. Just in one word, what is this entire thing? Because of course, we'll be looking at it in great detail very soon. But this is an event that really pushes Japan back and makes Japan think because you have an outsider coming in, putting across this kind of uh, gun policy and, and uh, they actually end up pushing away the Japanese elite and making them realize that they are in fact very weak. So the only two ways in which they thought they could survive is by isolating themselves even further, so going further back into Japan. But the other way they thought was to actually go ahead and compete and fight. And it is in this context that the entire idea of Western powers and learning from Western powers in order to defeat them comes up, all right? This entire concept of sending ships in these regions which are very close to the ocean, these uh, very peripheral regions from away from the country's capital, is very popular in the late 1800s. And China also falls through this. So does Japan. And at least they tried to. And this is, entire concept is called gunboat diplomacy. So instead of doing diplomacy through normal channels, you choose a gunboat to do what in other words is diplomacy but it's actually it's it's much more a thuggish and a kind of a gangster like behavior but uh, it's called in in pure and sweet terms of international relations it's called gunboat diplomacy before 1868 then so before facing all of this kind of a crisis in fact this this kind of a shame that that japanese elite had to go through before 1868 japan was in theory ruled by an emperor but in practice the power was wielded by the military government which was called the shogunate or the bakufu since 1603 the tokugawa and this is the major family or the dynasty had been the dominant clan of military leaders its head was called the shogun a title that translates as chief barbarian quelling uh, generalissimo and uh, below the shogun in the rank were a daimyo the feudal overlords with territory that they ruled and the daimyo together with samurai warriors who were loyal to them lived by a strict code of honor known as Bushido. So all the key terms, the samurais, etc., the daimyo, and of course the Bushido is the code of honor. Again, all of these key terms, they will form a part of content and understanding, which will then flow into your overall answer utility as far as sources are concerned. As with many European countries in the 19th century, Japan also experienced economic changes that impacted the organization of its society and politics. The feudalistic system with its very strict hierarchy had started to break down because of various kinds of, you know, population growth, merchant class considering themselves uh, inferior to the samurai and yet were growing in wealth. 
various obligations of the samurai to attend the capital uh, imperial court in Edo and the emergence of the Satsuma and the Choshu clans, ambitious rivals of the Tokugawa clan. So all of this shows basically all of these, these four kind of different uh, crises or rather expansion or changes, better than crisis, the term here is change. Remember continuity, change, these are all key terms of our uh, IB history syllabus. It shows that the Tokugawa regime was under a lot of pressure. And amongst all of this, these all these internal causes, mind you, that none of them are outside of Japan. The fact that more clans want to rival with Tokugawa is very much an interior, internal Japanese matter. But amongst all of this, you have the addition of an outside issue, which comes in the form of Commodore Perry and the black ships. So what is this entire case? Commodore Matthew Colbraith Perry or uh, Colbraith Perry of the United States Navy sailed into Edo, which was which is the old name for Tokyo, which is the capital. So he sailed into the Edo Harbor on 8th of July, 1853. Under his command was a fleet referred to as the four black ships of evil by the Japanese. Now, that's very important. Perry himself wouldn't call his own ships ships of black evil. It's how the Japanese have remembered those ships. They've called them the four black ships of evil. Perry came to demand, and this is how gunboat diplomacy is done, he came to demand open trade with a country that despite some early contact with Christian missionaries during the 17th century, had retreated into isolation from the West. So this is how politics was done back then. You come in a country, you come with four ships, and you tell them, either join open free trade with us, or we destroy you. So that's literally gunboat diplomacy. Diplomacy done at the I mean, with, with the gun held to your head, all right, at the point of a gun, therefore called gunboat diplomacy. So, according to Ian Buruma, the Japanese rulers, fearful of foreign aggression and worried that Christianity promoted by European missionaries would make their subjects unruly, had in fact outlawed the Christian religion, expelled most foreigners and all priests and forbidden Japanese to go abroad. So, this was the isolation that they had pulled themselves into from uh, after an early range of missionaries coming in. But very soon, they ended up with Matthew Perry's persuasion, for want of a better word. Clearly, it's not persuasion. It's actually a threat. But history remembers it as persuasion. They had to finally then agree. Uh, Perry bought the emperor a letter from the US president, Milliard Fillmore, demanding that American ships be allowed to trade with Japan. However, it was the shogun and not the emperor who would rule on such matters. Remember, shogun are still the most uh, elite group, the military group, which is led by the Tokugawa clan. And this is just one example of how little Japan was understood by the West at this time. Perry's meetings were not very successful as very few Japanese could speak in English, although some of them did speak Dutch as the Netherlands was the only nation so far which was allowed to have merchants directly with Japan. Perry returns to Japan once more in 1854, this time more heavily armed and he ordered his fleet to fire cannons to impress upon the Japanese that resistance was useless. As the United States had far greater force at its own disposal, disposal and concessions were made. And in 1858, a treaty giving further trading and residency rights to the United States was signed by a representative of the Bakufu. So the entire representative clan, they ended up signing a final treaty. The signatory, however, would later be assassinated by a samurai critical of the submission of Japan to a foreign power. So again, this kind of a very clear shift to trying to adapt to a Western power, this kind of a pure focus is on the one hand a problem. But at the same time, you can also see the chaos and churning that's happening within Japan as well. So it's not something that they are prepared for. It's not something that they have a policy for. It's, not, it's, it's something very unprecedented that's happening, in fact, with the Japanese as well. So, a representative of the Bakufu, if you remember very clearly, the Bakufu is an important group here. I've just gone back to that same page on page number 7. So, on page number 7, you have this entire description of all the key things. So, Bakufu is just another key term for a shogunate. So, it's a good idea just to have these key terms written down in one place so that they help you for quick reference at a later date. By the 1860s, it seemed that if Japan were to become or not to become, if it did not want to become a colony, but an equal of the Western powers, it would need to industrialize and modernize. To do so, it needed to cast off centuries of old rule of the Bakufu, which is the shogunate, and to replace the deeply traditional samurai warriors with well-equipped, well-trained army that would fight not only with swords, but with guns. So that's the shift that Japan needs to push itself into modernity. Not unexpectedly, factions emerged within and some of them supporting while others resisting this proposed shift 
in Japanese culture and values. Eager to seize the opportunity to remove the Tokugawa shogunate, the Satsuma and the Choshu clans, remember the clans which were already angry with the Tokugawa and they were potentially ambitious and were already showing their ambition even before all of this happened with the United States, they joined forces together with a modernized army, they challenged the Bakufu. So they challenged the prior traditional way of ruling, which was the shogunate. This was made easier by the death of Emperor Komoi in 1866, given that his successor, Emperor Miji, was a young man of 15 who could be influenced by the opponents of the Bakufu. So all of this adding a lot of more chaos than would have probably gone through had it not been for Matthew Perry. But despite his arrival, it's not as if the Japanese local causes disappear. They are very much a part of the equation even now. In 1867, the Tokugawa shogunate ceded political power, so they had to give up political power. Although what followed was a short and bloody civil war from 1868 to 69 between the Bakufu and the Imperial Army. So they did not want to give it up so easily, so the Imperial Army also had to then intervene. This ended with the defeat of the samurai and the restoration of the emperor. So the same emperor who was understood to be the key figure, remember Matthew Perry in his first visit had gone to visit the emperor because he didn't understand that actually the Tokugawa, the shogunate, they are the rulers. So this ended up in the restoration of the emperor as the key figure of authority and his residence was moved from Kyoto to Edo which was now called Tokyo. So earlier the Edo court they only had the key shogunate officers, the Tokugawa officers. All right, Tokugawa is the family that runs the shogunate. And in this case, they have now moved out and the emperor now moves from his earlier capital called Kyoto to Edo, which is called Tokyo. So now all the politics gets actually settled in Tokyo, even though earlier also it was the center of politics, but through the shogun, now it's the center of politics through the emperor. As Mikiso Hane argues, the population needed to be convinced that this was not a new system of government, but in fact a restoration of imperial rule. That's a very important point. Look at the word that is being used. The emperor is being restored to power. He's being brought back. So the, the argument that this is how it was intended to be, the shogunate was an aberration. They are the ones who were doing all the wrong things. Now we need to get back to the emperor as was always envisaged. As stated in the public declaration, it was the restoration of the indissoluble, so something that cannot be dissolved, link between the emperor and the common people. And because the new emperor is called the Miji, or he's called Miji or Mutsuhito, his era is called the Miji era. So that young emperor of 15 who takes over the throne after the death of his father, his era is the key era that would have a lot of key details that as we go forward. So the Meiji era signals the introduction of an elaborate personality cult of the emperor, something that will go on from the 1860s, late 1860s, right up till 1945, the end of the Second World War. The emperor becomes a very smart, I mean smart or important part of the entire conception or conceptualization of Japan. There's an elaborate personality cult that emerges around him. And he is very clearly seen as the divine ruler of the nation. He was also to be revered as the descendant of the sun goddess and thereby treated as a living god. All right, so he's not a representative of God. He is the living God. He, in his body, he embodies that divinity because he's a direct descendant of the living god, of the sun goddess, pardon me. Shintoism briefly became the official religion of Japan, although this ceased in 1872. Shinto shrines remained under state control and the Shinto belief that the imperial family was descended from the sun goddess remained of great importance. In this way, religion, emperor worship and nationalism were all intertwined. And this is what will lead to the stream of expansion as we go on. And anyone who questioned the mythological origin of the imperial dynasty was obviously going to get into trouble. Among the new shrines, shrines erected was the Yasukuni shrine in Tokyo, where the souls of those who had died for the emperor were in fact worshipped. And this of course then leads us to this key idea that is where most of the histories of the causes of expansion start, which is called the Meiji Restoration. Once again, just to underline, restoration is a word that is being used in order to legitimize this entire action. That this action is very legitimate. We are bringing back the Meiji emperor in this case. 
all right so the meiji restoration which is a time of a period of intense social and political change as the tokugawa shogunate lost power the authority of the emperor was in fact enhanced now he's moved to tokyo as well all right a new constitution was promised and when complete was referred to as the bunmai kaika or uh, which meant civilization and enlightenment according to ian baruma an elaborate ceremony had preceded the presentation of the constitution to the people so it was a constitution for the people so there was a gifting ceremony that took place emperor meiji entered the shinto shrine at the royal palace and explained the new constitution to his divine ancestors so he goes to a temple and he explains to his ancestors which must have been there in the form of idols or may have been there in the form of spirits that why i am doing this why i am moving this constitution to the people and assuring them that it meant not the end but rather a restoration of imperial authority so you can see that the emperor worship is also being used as a part to not only legitimize the meiji aspect but also give value to the nationalistic aspect look at the name of the constitution it's called enlightenment and civilization so the whole idea that at the end of the day this is something that is going to cause civilizational impetus to all the future proceedings a small percentage just over 1.14 of the percent composed of men over 25 years of age who paid above a certain amount of tax was now given the right to vote for members of a national diet which had a bicameral system so bicameral is a legislature which has two houses all right so a new parliament is envisaged now which is called the national diet and the two houses are being envisaged as the house of peers and the house of representatives very obviously for those of you who are smart enough you've already seen very obviously it's adapting to the western ways of having a certain kind of political life the idea of a bicameral legislature is perhaps directly being taken from the united states where there has been in existence a bicameral legislature since their early parts of independence after 1776 so this is a directly connected so this is you could say that this is one of the ways in which the meiji emperor is thinking of moving towards or envisaging the move towards modernity of being like the western powers the purpose of the diet was to assist the emperor in his decision making he could both veto legislation and enact his imperial edicts when the diet was not in session something very similar will happen also in russia after 1905 when the duma is established by the tsar there of course there it's a matter of pressure it's done after a, a revolution which is called the 1905 revolution here the emperor seems to be doing it himself because he sees the national diet or the national parliament as a body that will support him that will assist him in taking these decisions in reality the emperor was expected to accept the advice offered by the genroin or a group of advisers whose role was not outlined in the constitution but who were nevertheless very influential and acted as a link between the emperor and the government so there are these extra constitutional bodies as well which in fact have this kind of an existence one very important aspect of the new constitution was the military was responsible directly to the emperor no longer to anybody else so the emperor emerges as the supreme commander of the military and the supreme authority lay with the emperor but as he was meant to be above politics decisions would be made in his name so this is how constitutional monarchy works everywhere else today in the modern times we call it constitutional monarchy so the queen of england or the king of england now pardon me will not make those changes but at the end of the day they are all done in his name all right uh, this meant that although all his subjects owed him their loyalty and although he held ultimate power the emperor was not expected to make political decisions not only not make political decisions or be seen as politically aligned because politics was a very low level thing which he was supposed to be very above amongst the social changes for the remaining part of this video let's quickly look at education military and uh, the first sino japanese war so these are the three key themes that we shall cover in the remaining part of this video so if you look at education like russia in the second half of the 19th century reform was needed so that the military could be trained and equipped to rival the armies and navies of western powers japan had to move quickly from centralized feudalism where just a privileged few would rule over most of the others and in this case the privileged few just like in russia you have the kulaks the rich peasants here the privileged few are called the samurai warriors they are the ones who are ruling the rest of the country to a state in which ordinary citizens would be conscripted into the into its army so they are now moving just from elite samurai warriors to conscription where even ordinary citizens above a certain age would be trained by the army 
Soldiers would be recruited in large numbers and taught to obey only the emperor and their nation. A basic level of universal literacy was necessary as recruits needed to read basic orders and operate new technology. To aid this, a new system of elementary schooling was introduced in 1872. It was not free and at first attendance was relatively low. According to Mikiso Hane, by 1876, 46% of the boys and only 16% of girls attended school. Education would also be the means by which nationalism was instilled into the population. So you use schools to tell people about the great Japanese history and to try and tell them that they are in fact a part of that great legacy of the Japanese past. In 1890, the imperial rescript on education was, uh, rescript on education was introduced. The rescript had to be memorized and recited each morning by teachers and pupils an edict that remained in place until World War II. So you had to remember the script that was given by the emperor, a new script that was given by the emperor that had to be remembered. The rescript began, this kind of a promise began with the assertion, know ye are subjects and outline the various obligations of Japanese subjects to the of the emperor, including the following, such as that should an emergency arise, offer yourself courageously to the state. So this kind of an everyday repetition of what in the modern world is called a national anthem or in the modern world is called a national pledge. So this kind of a rescript was introduced and every morning it had to be repeated by teachers and students across Japan, a practice that remained till the Second World War. According to Han, the purpose of this rescript was that the minds of young children were molded to ensure that when the time came, they should go to battle shouting Imperial Majesty Banzai. That means, may you win. Children were also taught that the imperial dynasty dated from 600 BCE, a date that was commemorated every year on 11th of February when Jimu, the first emperor, had ascended to the throne and the other important national holiday celebrated Emperor Meiji's birthday, which was on November 3rd. So this entire kind of an emperor worship translating into or translating through rather a, per a cult of personality. So in the personality of the emperor lies all the benefit for the entire state. The military too would be reformed because very clearly the educational reforms seem to be translating directly there. The armed forces of Meiji Japan sold loyalty solely to the emperor, which was a significant departure from many things or the way things were done under the Tokugawa shogunate. Furthermore, with the introduction of conscription, all Japanese men had to serve three years of the army and four years in the reserve. So this somehow breaks the kind of absolute control that the previous Tokugawa had over the army. This is broken because now every citizen is a part of the army through training. And how are these citizens being molded? They are being molded in the schools where they are taking the pledge towards the emperor. So everything gets named and framed in a way that loyalty towards the emperor supersedes loyalty over anything else. The rescript of the soldiers. So soldiers also have a, a rescript. Soldiers and Sailors was published in 1882. And this, like the rescript on education, established the absolute loyalty to the emperor. So we are your supreme, so it, it says, a part of it says we, which is the emperor, are your supreme commander in chief. We rely on you as our limbs and you look up to us as your head. So that's the relationship. The army is the limb, the emperor is the head. And you need to repeat that every day till the time it's instilled in your physical head because your actual head is of course the emperor as per the rescript here. Soldiers and sailors were not allowed to express any political opinions, nor could they comment on imperial policies, even in private. Buruma sees this as the flaw in the system of absolute loyalty to the emperor, as in the 1930s, eager young officers could and would defy a civilian government if they suspected it of acting against the imperial will. So this kind of an absolute loyalty to imperial will and imperial authority completely takes away from them any kind of regard for civil government and civil officers. This very briefly has been an overview of the transition to the Meiji Restoration. It has explained how Japan, along with other countries at this time, made use of ideology of nationalism and set in place a system that bound the people to their emperor. As with many European countries at this time, Japan began to look for opportunities to expand the territory under its control. So this kind of an expansionism was very much a part of where this nationalism would go. So this kind of support to the emperor would have to reach somewhere and of course the military expansion was a part of it and uh, this was done uh, for a number of reasons one is to elevate other reasons why expansion is necessary is to of course elevate itself as an imperial power all other imperial powers are doing it we should also do it to access resources for a growing population the population is growing you need to provide for them these are by the way the same logics that also apply to colonialism 
you know, that kind of status, imperial status and similarly provide for your own population. And finally, to secure territory that might otherwise have fallen under the control of rivals, especially Russia, Britain, France or the United States. So I am not doing it for myself, but because I don't want others to have it, therefore I should also go ahead and conquer territories. This is exactly, as I said, the logic of the European colonialism. We unfortunately don't have time to cover the next topic. So for that, we'll have to look at the next video. But this forms a perfect ending for this video because you can see very clearly that because of these causes, friction is going to be the obvious next impact. Conflict is going to be the next obvious impact because in a world where everybody wants more and more territory, you are bound to be in conflict with those around you. And the first of these conflicts will not arise, in fact, interestingly, from Russia, Britain, France or United States, the countries that Japan is aping, but will in fact arise, like most often it usually does even in modern world politics, from the immediate neighbour, pardon me, which in this case is China. So their first war would be with China, which is where we shall start our next video with the first Sino-Japanese War of 1894. So thank you so much for your time and I do look forward to seeing you in the next video.